Okay, guys. As you can see, there is a light over there. Sorry, I don't want you to see my chest hairs and be tempted. Is that light bothering you? Is that light bothering you? Let's see. This way? No. Yeah, that's not okay. Should I turn off the light? I think so, right? Hold on. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Is this too dark? Yeah, I think it's too dark. Hold on. How about now? Is this lighting okay? Is the lighting okay? Or do you need more light? I don't know who's Brother Josh, sheep work. And are you a fan of Brother Josh? Then I'll debate you. Who's Brother Josh? As if I know Brother Josh. Is it okay? If it's too bright, it may bother you guys. I'm at Child of God's home. His internet connection is outstanding. So I'll be using his internet connection for the time being. I think I'm going to stop doing it from my brother's place. Okay, so sheep work, what does that tell me about a teacher at Absolute Bible Truth? Okay. We haven't even started the session and you're trying to challenge me, sheep work? Let's try this again, friend. Who is Josh and why should I care? Hey, at first last, welcome everyone. Zina, welcome. Shlama Ziza. Shlama Joe. Sister, thank you for your concern. Thank you, Anna Growing. Oh, by the way, pray that book that I bought, Know Your Faith, about the Orthodox faith, I misplaced it somewhere. So sheep work is, you're trying to scare me or something? I first don't know, I don't remember if you're a Trinitarian or not. You're trying to scare me that he's the top debater? You know I'm going to be shaking my boots. I'm going to lose sleep, right? Because I'm scared now. Okay, well, Sheep, can you tell me you're a Trinitarian? And to let me know that you worship the Trinity so I know where you're coming from? I don't remember anyone. I mean everyone. I mean anyone, sorry. I don't remember everyone that comes. So here you start off saying, when are you going to debate Bro Josh? You even called him Bro Josh. If you're a Trinitarian, why do you call an anti-Trinitarian your brother? See, this is where you confuse me, you see? Hey, are you going to debate bro Josh on the Trinity? I don't call anti-Trinitarians my brothers. Why are you calling him bro Josh? Sheep, I'm on a count of five because I want to start the session positive. I want to start it in a loving manner in a very humble manner where I'm kind to my brothers and sisters and gracious and patient with them because you already started on the wrong foot with me. So I'm going to count of five, calm down, because I don't want to have to say bye-bye to my friend sheep, okay? Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. <sighs> Mellow. Mellow. Okay, right now. So sheep work, let's try this over again. I just start this session. Namaste, brother. And you come out of nowhere saying, hey, when are you going to debate bro Josh on the Trinity? Why don't you debate him, sheep? Why are you waiting for me to debate him? Why do you think I'm God's gift to apologetics? That I have to debate everyone and anyone? Because somehow I'm the proof of Christianity? <laughs> Sheep, you need to go. Don't let me shear you, sheep. Listen, brother. Let me remind you, sheep. Let me remind. How about this? We have a saying in Assyrian. Sleeman Susuch. In a saying, we say to someone who's high and mighty, we say Sleeman Susuch. English, come down from your horse. Get off your horse. <laughs> I should have been in movies, right? As you can tell, <clears throat> my voice is not 100% from all the speaking I did over the weekends. Sheep, here, let me just share something with you. 
And I say this in love. I thank God for you. You're a Trinitarian. May the Lord Jesus seal you. I wouldn't mind debating Josh. Let him know. Sam Shimon is willing to come and debate you. And I promise you, by the power of the living Trinity, the trying God who is God, who is Israel, I will destroy him and his false God and shame him by the power of the triumph God who is real. But with that said, let me just remind you of something. Don't make me more than I am. Okay, sheep? Let me remind you. Don't make me more than I am. And I'm saying this with all sincerity by the grace of God. I am as the rest of us are until Jesus comes and transforms us completely. An imperfect, fallen, tainted, sinful, finite creature who's trusting in my spirit to purify me, to change me, and to make me more like Jesus. And because I'm fallen and because I'm imperfect, I struggle with low self-esteem, damaged ego, pride. Arrogance, self-righteousness, envy, you name it. Okay? So don't make anyone that you look, look up to more than they are. Because I promise you, sheep, if you look up to some human being and make them more than they are, they will offend you, they will hurt you, they'll break your heart. And if you're not anchored in Jesus, it can make you use that as an excuse to leave the faith. Okay? Thank the triune God, thank the Lord Jesus, that early on, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit took me captive for Jesus, to fall in love with Jesus, because many of the apologists I look up to disappointed me, hurt me badly, but because my hope wasn't in them, it was in Christ, that just made me despise them, and God healed my heart. And I will disappoint you, you guys see that, I will hurt you, I'll offend you. Now, I don't, I don't want to do that, <clears throat> but... Don't make anyone more than they are. Don't make anyone more than they are. You can't make enough of Jesus. You got to make Jesus everything, your all in all, because you can't love him enough, you can't glorify him enough, and you can't think highly of him enough because he's the God man, okay? So don't make me more than I am. And in Jesus' name, I pray, please, Lord, Bring in many more people by your spirit to these sessions. I'm hoping we hit that 200 mark eventually for your glory, Lord Jesus. Okay? Folks, just to give you an update on February 10, I don't want to speak presumptuously because I don't want to speak ahead of the Lord if the Lord is doing something other than what I think he's doing. May the Lord have mercy and be patient with me and save me because of his grace and love, not because I deserve it. I found out from a brother, a dear brother in Christ who's helping me in Illinois, because I'm not there, that that judge that's supposed to preside, she's been gone for a week. She wasn't there last week. She wasn't there today. She won't be there tomorrow. And it's not because of vacation. She's just gone for now. I'm hoping that's a sign of Jesus, that he's answering your prayers and he's doing something behind the scenes, something miraculous. That's what I'm hoping. And that God will show up in a mighty way and deliver me to be free, free to serve him without any fears, you know, without any stress. So pray for that. Yeah, yeah, say Christian. My brother in Christ was there. For a whole week, she wasn't there today. She won't be there tomorrow. It's not because she's on vacation. Please, Lord. I hope something's happening. Sai Christian. And Sai Christian can tell you, he's here. I'm a little more open about my situation, but Sai Christian, can you tell people how wicked and evil and satanic this judge is that she's of the devil? Can you confirm that, brother, so they don't think I'm just talking? He's right here, I'll tell you. <clears throat> Beautiful sounding language. Are you making fun of me? Hope not. No, I just want him to confirm because people will say, Sam, you're too much. You know, and no, no, no. I just want, you know, mouth of two or three witnesses. Yeah, hit that like button before I hit you. Okay. So, but now, another thing happened. Sai Christian knows this uh, particular person, Alan. 
my friend there, see, here goes Hader Wood. He needs to go to jail because he needs a prison ministry, right? And I hope he benefits from, what was his name? That brother who passed away, who, who became a believer in Christ, and he had prison ministry. He was part of the, was that president? What was his name? Chuck, was it? What was that? He had an excellent prison ministry. He was part of Watergate. He became a believer in Jesus. Chuck Colson, right? Was that his name? Chuck Colson? Yeah, Chuck Norris, yeah. Chuck Colson. I pray that David Wood will continue to benefit from Chuck Colson's prison ministry because he goes to prisons and he ministers. So I'm hoping David will benefit once again from that prison ministry. Now, if you guys are smart and sharp, you understand what I just said. <laughs> Another thing, my brother in Christ there who's representing me because I can't be there. So you guys got it, right? See, so you smart apologists. Glory to God, pray. My friend there, who's a brother in Christ, who I discipled over the years, he actually had to fire the attorney that was representing me because he lied again, and he caught him in his lies and deceit. So pray. God is doing something, and I'm trusting in my God for his glory. Right? Yep. Right, anyway. With that said, with that said, are we about, are you guys ready? Let me know. Yep, yep. Say Christian put limit in a kelba dagana. Anyway, I gotta be careful what I say because there are Syrians who can understand me. He busted him up in a major lie. Come doubt la pamrazile. What was the other question? Yeah, I know, but Sai Christian, you see the situation we're in, huh? We're in a desperate situation. What do you want us to do? Zina, why are you bearing false witness, sister? What swearing? Miri kelba degala means dog liar. Right, if that's swearing, you just condemn the Bible for swearing. You need to face the east and repent. By the way, Zena, I didn't know Razzles was your brother. Where is he? Razzle Dazzle. I didn't know he was your brother. And what's his name's brother? Choose Jesus. Because uh he was not deliberately, but he did get on my nerves, poor guy. And then I blocked him, and then he still watched my live stream and he sent a comment saying, I still love you, Sam, even though you blocked me. And I'm Zena's brother. So he broke my heart. I felt so sad. I go, because Zena's your sister, you've already suffered enough hell and purgatory growing up with that woman. So I'm going to show you grace and I'm going to unblock you. Right? So he's been unblocked. Okay, I hope it's not too dark here. Right? Yes, Jojo, I will be doing a series on the Nicene Creed. I promise you. Yeah, Angela, tell your husband, here he's going to get comedy relief. He's going to get drama for Zena's mama. He's going to get to hear people get chewed out, cussed out, all in love, mind you. Yeah. See, choose Jesus. That's Zena's brother. This poor man knows what it's like to taste purgatory. Ever since Zena's was born, he's been in purgatory, and he's hoping that we pray him out of purgatory. Stop it. Shame on you. Hush. Quiet. All right. Anyway, folks, can you pray for me to find that book? I bought a book two days ago, Know Your Faith. In my estimation, it was one of the best introductions to the Orthodox faith. I have books by Roman Catholics. I have books by Scott Hahn. I have books by Patrick Madrid. I have books by Trent Horn, trying to explain and defend Catholicism. I have a few books on the Orthodox Church, but in my estimation, this book, Know Your Faith, was one of the best books I've read because the author knows how to capture your attention, and I was enjoying it, but today, I lost it. I can't find it. Thankfully, they have another copy in that church, and Lord willing, if I don't find my copy, I'm going to go purchase another one, but man, I don't have a money tree. It was 24 bucks, right? Excellent, excellent book. Because you see, let me let me share something with you. We're going to begin. Some people are great speakers, but boring <clears throat> writers. Some people are great writers, but terrible at speaking. It is a rare gift from the Holy Spirit where you can have someone who's a great speaker and a great writer. All I could tell you is that this book was very enjoyable because the way he wrote captured your attention. And I was learning 
what the Orthodox believe. Because believe it or not, in the West, people know more about Roman Catholicism because it's the Western Church. And the Protestant Reformation was in response to Roman Catholicism. But they don't know as much about the Orthodox faith. Right? They don't know. Now, I picked this up at that church. St. Haralambos Greek Orthodox Church. Someone's wondering, ma'am was wondering, who's St. Haralambos? He's one of the saints of the Orthodox Church, who was a bishop of the Orthodox Church, who suffered for Jesus and was willing to die as a martyr. And as they came to kill him, the Lord Jesus summoned him home. And according to witnesses, now guys, I'm one of those who believe. Jesus still does miracles till this day because he's alive. So he can appear in a dream or a vision or do something miraculous as long as those miracles and dreams and visions do not contradict the Bible. So when someone tells me some great man of God in the past or even the present, right, was empowered to do something or the Lord did something miraculous to confirm that man or woman, I have no doubt because Christ is risen. He's alive. He's alive. And that same Jesus yesterday, today, and forever, same Jesus who can do miracles today, and he does do miracles. And from the Protestant perspective, if you don't believe me, do a search on YouTube, Lee Strobel, Case for Miracles. This is a Protestant evangelical. So don't say, oh, he's into saint worship. Okay. He did a documentary and wrote a book providing actual documentation, medical documentation, for at least two miraculous healings. Jesus is still in the business of doing healings, miracles, in order to show he is real and he's the God of the church. And the church is his spiritual body. Now, Haralambos, according to his story, he was around 113 years old. When they came to kill him, the witnesses there heard a voice saying, Well done, thou faithful servant. And he died before they could behead him, kill him. That shook the soldiers so badly, they converted, gave their life to the Lord, got baptized, and then they got killed for converting. I have no reason to doubt that miracle story. I have no reason to doubt that miracle story. Why? Because my Jesus, your Jesus, is risen, he's alive, he is real, he is reality, and he is mighty to save and do miracles. And here, let's not even go that far. Let me show you something. Hold on. Amen. Ma'am, may Jesus give us the power to live for him first and die for him, and that our death will bring him glory as well as our life, because he is worthy. And I say this, and I mean this, though I love him imperfectly to my shame, I love Jesus. I'm in love with Jesus. I can't imagine life without him, even though I fail him. And I'm a pathetic excuse for a Christian. Okay? I am a pathetic excuse for a Christian. I am. Anger issues. I even make David Wood look humble. And you know that's that's bad. Anyone who can make David Wood look humble, you know that's bad. In fact, as I told David Wood in the conference, I told David in the conference, you give the black Hebrew Israelites an excuse to hate the white man. You are the typical white man that the black man speaks out against right hater would anyway let me show you this so let's okay you're saw oh, come on sam you're sounding too catholic or no 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 no. okay let's put that aside here you have a testimony of a jewish woman <clears throat> who came to believe jesus as her messiah here it is this comes from the youtube channel one for israel one for Israel. Here she is. This is right now. This is a recent testimony. Guys, save the link. This woman lived a very grossly sexually immoral life. She dabbled into the occult. And through the Ouija board, she contacted an evil spirit. It's all part of her testimony. I just gave you the link. When the spirit contacted them through the Ouija board, they asked the spirit, what is your name? You know what the spirit told her? Here, let me give you the link. <clears throat> you know what the spirit told her his name was? Remember, she's Jewish. She knows nothing about the Bible. She's Jewish. She knows nothing about the Bible. 
Legion, bam, how'd you guys know? My goodness, three of you got it right. The spirit said, my name is Legion. How'd you guys know that? Did you watch it? Now she's a Jew. She doesn't know about the gospels. She doesn't know about the gospels. Okay. She goes, after that, she became very evil and dark and wicked. And so a pastor friend of hers told her to pray to Jesus to deliver her. This is her story, folks. She goes, as she went to sleep, Jesus showed up in her room. He showed up in a vision. This is her story. And she said, who are you? And he goes, I'm Jesus. She goes, I'm Jewish. Right? You know, we have nothing to do with you. You know what Jesus told her? He goes, I am Jewish too, and you're mine. I am Jewish too, and you are mine. <clears throat> That's what he said to her. Okay, folks, let's put the story of St. Haralambos aside. Are you going to tell me this Jewish woman is also lying? Are you going to tell me Lee Strobel is lying? There are bona fide documented miraculous healings by even secular medical experts because the spirit realm is real. Miracles do take place. Dreams and visions do occur, but not every healing, miracle, dream, and vision is from God because Satan and his demons also can heal and afflict and appear in dreams and visions to deceive people. So why do I believe in her testimony? Why do I believe in those medical miracles of Lee Strobel that he documented? Why do I believe in the miracle of St. Heralambos? Do you know? Uh, hold on. Yeah, no, I have no idea why. I don't know why it's buffering here. It's Child of God's Room. Okay. Do you know why? Do you know why? I believe in their stories. Do you know why? Because they are Trinitarians who worship the one true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who worship Jesus as the God-man, who believe the Bible, Old and New Testaments, are the inspired, inerrant words of the true God. So why would I reject their miraculous stories? Let me repeat. There is a spirit realm, and it's real. So not every dream, vision, and miracle is from the triune God. Sometimes Satan can appear in a dream and a vision or evil spirit to deceive you and do something miraculous. So how do I distinguish bona fide miracles from satanic deception? You know how? You guys ready again? You want me to repeat? How do I? Because when you have someone like this great man, St. Heralambos, a Trinitarian who spent all his life worshiping the Trinity, Worshipping Jesus as the God-man. Believing that the Bible is inspired word of God. The Gospels are inspired revelations of historical Jesus. Who affirmed the death and physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. And return of Jesus. I have no reason to doubt that Jesus did a miracle for this man. Sure he can, Zena. But did you hear my answer, Zena? I just answered you again. Even here now? Is this too? Sorry, guys, I don't know. Uh, Child of God has top-notch internet, and I'm by the router, and it's buffering. I don't know if it's because it's probably raining here. Over here, it's raining, which is unusual. So keep praying for the connection. Okay, so did you hear my answer? How do I distinguish? How do I distinguish a bona fide miracle from the triune God from a satanic counterfeit because of the belief of the person or the message of that dream or vision. Clear? Everyone understand? Okay, hold on. I got to turn on the light real quick. Hold on. Uh oh. That's why. Hold on. Sorry. Hold on, guys. I'm going to turn off the light in a minute. I just need to do something. Hold on. Okay. Okay, now. 
The reason why I need the light is because I picked this up at St. Haralambo's Greek Orthodox Church. Now you're going to hear the people. See, I thought Sam was going to be Roman Catholic, but I was wrong. He's going to be Greek Orthodox. Tikanis, kesikala. Come on, Eddie. Tikanis. Man, I got a face for Hollywood. I'm so gorgeous. Okay. Let me now read to you. I picked this up today at St. Haralambo's Greek Orthodox Church. What a powerful prayer to the triune God. I just want to read it. It's a prayer. And then we'll go into using Joe's Witness Bible against them. Are you ready? What a powerful. Can I, it's a it's little lengthy, but I want you to pray it with me because it is a prayer to the triune God. So in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, may he sanctify this prayer and sanctify our hearts to offer this prayer to the triune God who is worthy of all worship. Okay, are you ready? <clears throat> now tell me which of you will object to this prayer. Yes, is he going to remind me before I shut down? Glory to you who has shown us the light. Glory to God in the highest. And peace on earth, goodwill among all. We sing out hymns of praise to you. We bless, we worship and glorify you. We give our thanks to our God for your magnificent glory. For your magnificent glory. Lord, King, Heavenly God, Father Almighty. Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit. Lord, God, the Lamb of God, the Son of the Father, who takes away the worldly sin. Have mercy on us. You who took away the sins of the world. You who are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer and have mercy on us. And we're praying it. By the power of the Holy Spirit, from our hearts to you, O oh God, receive this prayer from us. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever. And to the ages of ages, grant, O oh Lord, that on this day we may, we may be kept without sin. Let me repeat that because this is our prayer. Grant, O oh Lord, that on this day we may be kept without sin. Blessed are you, O Lord, God of our fathers, forever and ever your name be praised and glorified. Amen. <clears throat> Lord, your mercy come upon us, for we have placed all our hope in you. <clears throat> blessed are you, O Lord, blessed Lord. Teach me your commandments. Blessed are you, O Lord, blessed Lord. Teach me your commandments. Blessed are you, O Lord. Blessed Lord, teach me your commandments. From generation to generation, O Lord, you have been our refuge. I said, Lord, have mercy on me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. Lord, unto you I have fled. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. For with you is the source of life, and in your light we shall see light. Extend your loving kindness to those who know you. Holy is God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal. Have mercy on us. Holy is God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal. Have mercy on us. Glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. Holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Holy is God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Salvation to the world has come today. Let us sing to him who is risen from the dead, the author of our life, for he has conquered death by death. This victory he has given us and his great mercy. Anyone object to this prayer? Anything wrong with this prayer? Any, anything wrong with this prayer? Or an amazing prayer to the triune God. Okay. Amazing prayer to the triune God. What's my point, folks? Be open to learn from all the different branches and flavors of Christianity. Pray to the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, you protect me from error and falsehood. Guide me into all truth and give me the grace to accept something true no matter from what tradition it comes from. 
You want me there? Pray that prayer and trust the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth. Right? Ever since I prayed that prayer, God has opened doors and allowed me to see things that before I refused to see. And I feel free, free to trust in the Holy Spirit, free to let the Bible say what it says. I feel free. Right? I don't feel bound to make the Bible agree with a certain theological system anymore. You know, I, I'm free to explore and to trust and believe. Right? So, anyway, with that said, pray I can find that book. Right? Pray I find that book, Know Our Faith. It was an excellent book. I was going to finish it, man. And today I lost it. I don't get it. May the Lord purify my heart, sanctify my heart. O Lord Jesus, sanctify my heart and my motives by your precious blood, by your spirit. Grant us all your heart, Lord Jesus. Our hearts, may it be your everlasting throne and the hearts of our loved ones. The hearts of my daughters are your throne, Lord Jesus. Sanctify us. Sanctify me in this session. Lord Jesus, I ask you, fill us with your spirit. Give us the power to trust in you, to love you, to hope in you, to cleave to you, to cling to you, and never doubt you, Lord Jesus. You are life. You are alive. You are real. You are the Son of the Father. And you will come, and we will see you, Lord Jesus. Strengthen my voice, Lord Jesus, my lungs and my chest. Bless this session. Anoint me, recall your words, Lord Jesus, and interpret them perfectly by the power of the Spirit. Bless your church, your body that's present, born of your spirit, born from your love, Lord Jesus. Seal us, teach us, perfect us by your spirit. Save us from attacks of the enemy, distractions from the enemy. Clothe us with your righteousness. Seal us in your love. Surround us with a wall of fire from your Holy Spirit. Our loved ones, my daughters, Lord Jesus, love them as only you can love them. Bring them to me and set me free from these shackles so I can be free to serve you, Lord Jesus. And I ask, Lord, by your power for every one of us, give us the power to live for you and, if necessary, die for you, that our life will bring you glory that you deserve and our death will glorify you still. We love you, Lord Jesus. We don't love you enough to our shame. But give us the grace to love you more and more. Trust in you, Lord Jesus. To trust in you, Lord Jesus. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Son of God, <clears throat> virgin born son of Mary, the root and offspring of David, have mercy on us, Lord Jesus. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. In Jesus' name, amen. Kyrie eleison is the Greek for Lord, have mercy. See, I got you excited. Asai Christian. Plupman Allah Asai Christian. Muriya Allah Yamshika, please. Paula, please. We need a break. Asai Christian. Tikanis, Kesikala. What's wrong with you, Ere? Tikanis, Kesikala. What's wrong with you, Ere? I don't know too much Greek. I just know a little bit of a Greek. Let me give you. Khalit Mshika, Asai Christian. Let me tell you where I learned the, the Greek from. Growing up in Chicago, the Syrians and the Greeks would intermix. In fact, my brother, Kareem, I'm going to just share this with you. Yeah. Can I see? Yeah. Let me tell you. My brother, Kareem, went out with one of the most stunningly beautiful Greek woman God has ever created. She was a model. She had light brown hair. My goodness, she was like an angel. I can mention her name because it's a common name. Her name was Tanya. Whew. She was stunning, man. And you know what's even more amazing? Her brother was better looking than her. She had a brother... The most handsome human being I've ever seen in my life. 
Her brother? I'm telling you, man. The guy was so good looking, he made her look ugly. And she was drop dead beautiful. Yes. Sam Shima, who do you think it was? Ben Malik, right? I'm telling you. And then we grew up in Paul's Snack Shop. Paul's Snack Shop was a Greek restaurant in the area, and all the Assyrians would go there. All the Assyrians would eat there. So I'd hear, I would hear, and then there was a, like a submarine so shop owned by a little short, round, rotunda Greek guy. He was bald. And his claim to fame, he had a picture with Telly Savadas. Who loves you, baby? Because a lot of people don't know. Telly Savadas is Greek. So he'd come in, he'd say, okay, Ere, what do you want to eat, Ere? What, what? What 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 you're ordering, Ere? Fries? Okay, come on, Ere. Come on. Get us. Okay. Yeah. So he would always say, Ere. I still don't know what that means, to be honest with you. Right? And then I'd hear them say, Tikanis, Kesikala. Yeah, that's it. That's all I know. Yeah. By the way, what does Ere mean? Why do, why do Greeks always say, Ere? Come on, Ere. What does that mean? Does anyone know? So you're shouting at me? That little round rotunda of a Greek guy who was bald? He was the rudest dude in the planet, but boy, did he make some great food. That's why I used to come back. Yeah. I'd sit there and look. Come on, Ere. What do you want, Ere? Right? Okay, anyway. All right. With that said... Lord be glorified. Are we ready? Let me know if you want me to stop the series, Joe's Witnesses and the Trinity, or continue until I provide a thorough, thorough case showing you what verses to use to prove the Trinity. Because you know what else I want to do? I want to start. All the series I started, I want to finish. What's up, brother? God bless you. God bless you too. And Lord's willing. But I want to start a new series. The Biblical Basis for the Nicene Creed. So what I can do is, starting maybe next week, begin that series, the biblical basis for the Nicene Creed, and then I'll go back and forth. John Witness Bible, Nicene Creed, and God willing, I will do John. Okay. Posus, Elenes, Eche, Edo, Re, Paidia, Paidia, Paidia. That means child. All right. Okay. Gris Dino. Oh, hey, Gr Chris. Guess what her brother's name was? His name was Dino. Man, Chris, her name was Tanya, and her brother's name was Dino. I just remembered. Your name just, uh, just clued me in. Boy, what a hand. Dude, let me tell you something. I know it's going to sound weird saying, this man, the Christian, talk like this. Dino was so handsome, he would even make straight men question their straightness. And it would be a struggle because you'd have to pray for protection. That's how handsome this dude was. Sucker. Man, dude. Where do you, why couldn't I have his parents? Why couldn't my mom and dad be Dino's mom and dad, Tanya's mom and dad, so I could have been a gorgeous Assyrian hunk? Yeah, but it's, your last name is Dino, sucker. Anyway. Zina, before I end the session, ask me that question from Leviticus about slavery so I can briefly comment on it. Right? Everyone ready? Yeah, but I could have been a good-looking Sam Shimon. I could have had light brown hair, and he had, I believe, green eyes. He had like a six-pack. So that could be Sam Shimon looked like that, right? He had a six-pack, and I have a keg. Six-pack, and I have a keg. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there we go. Let's begin, folks. Are you ready? Are you ready now to explore the Jehovah's Witness Bible and use it to glorify the triune God? Yeah. Constadinos out of the emperor's. Oh, that's where the name comes. Constadinos. Okay, now we're good. Okay, folks. I could have been a gorgeous Assyrian. This is the first thing I hear clicking on this live stream. Why are you hating, Luis? Uh, Luis, why hate? Why don't you just pray? Or are you saying, I am a, a gorgeous Assyrian hunk? Jerkins! By the way, I hope my daughters watch this. 
they love when I do this. Jerkins! Jerkins! <laughs> Jerkins! Jerkins! <laughs> One thing I have noticed, though, even though I get skinnier all over my body, my head still is an oversized, you know, melon head. That's the only thing that doesn't shrink is my head. With that said, let's begin. Before I even do that, even though we had a lot of internet problems yesterday, was the message still clear enough <clears throat> how even in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, the book of Revelation is a nightmare to the Jehovah's Witnesses because the book of Revelation, even in their perverted Bible, goes out of its way to depict God, meaning the Father, Jesus the Lamb, as the one true God, Jehovah. They're not the same person, but they're the same God. So I hope at least that was clear enough that even though with all the technical issues. And again, I want you to pray for first and the last. Amen. Pray for Protestant believer, for the mods. Pray for a child of God because these men are making it possible for me to do this. Protestant believer and first and last are starting out to beatify the YouTube page. They're adding thumbnails. They're adding you know verses in the background. They're going to help me to make it the best I can possibly make it, and they don't get paid for this. And child of God is allowing me to inconvenience him in his own home using his Internet. None of them get paid for this. They do it because they love Jesus. So pray for them. Pray for their prosperity in Christ. Now, with that said, let's continue using the Jehovah Witness Bible to demonstrate, to demonstrate that even in their perverted Bible, Jesus Christ is clearly depicted as Jehovah God in the flesh. Okay, let's go to Hebrews. Let's start in Hebrews. Let's start in Hebrews. And then, Lord willing, maybe next week we'll begin the biblical basis for the Nicene Creed. And I'll ask you at the end of this, if you want me to start it next week, God willing, and then go through the Gospel of John, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And hopefully, as we keep working on this, we're going to get a thousand like Haterwood does. You know, that hater. All right. Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews 1. Let's read Hebrews 1, verses 2 to 3. You guys ready for some meat? I don't like vegan. I'm a meat eater. Hebrews 1, verses 2 to 3. Now, as Protestant posts from the Jehovah's Witness Bible, let me remind you again. Can I remind you again? Let me remind you again. I don't want you to think that just because you present these passages and these objections, somehow droves of Jehovah's Witnesses will become Trinitarian. No, I don't want you to be naive. The fact is, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, and this is not being a Calvinist. Forget about the title Calvinism Ar Arminian. I'm being a Biblicist. The fact is, it has to be the Holy Spirit of the living God taking your words, convicting the heart of the person, hearing your words, setting them free from any hindrance and bondage, opening their minds and hearts to see the truth and accept it. That's why you always have to pray, Holy Spirit, I'm an instrument in your hand, in your sovereign hands. Use me to bring people to the feet of Jesus because that's what you do best. And you use imperfect human vessels. Is that clear? Is that clear? And let me give you a passage. Yes, Daryl Nutt channel. But one thing, as I've said, if you've listened to the previous sessions, never tell a Jehovah Witness what the Bible means. Because then they're going to shut you down. Because you cannot know what the Bible means because the Bible is not written for you. It's written for the anointed class. Ask questions and ask enough questions. And trust the Spirit to use those questions to penetrate their hearts and minds and trouble their conscience. Okay. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. Let me show you this point. I want to establish this. So I don't mislead people in thinking, you use these arguments and droves of those witnesses will come to faith. No. No. That's not the case. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3 in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. 
Watch here. Light expect expedition. Light expeditions. Can you make your name harder? Ask me that before I shut down, and I'll give you one. First Corinthians twelve verse three. Now I would have you know that nobody, when speaking by God's Spirit, says Jesus is accursed, and nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by Holy Spirit. Let me repeat that last part. Nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by Holy Spirit. I'm going to say it three times because I'm a Trinitarian. Nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? Christians, do you believe your Bible? Of course you do. You wouldn't be Christians. So do you see what Paul says? No one can confess Jesus from a true confession from a heart made alive, filled with true faith and love in Jesus as Lord, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. I don't like your name, Booty Bandit. I don't know if you're here to mock and insult, brother. Booty Bandit is really insulting, especially to sisters. That's very disrespectful to the sisters, the women of God. Okay, you with me there? Now, with that said... Angela picked up on it. Let me have Protestant repeat that passage one more time. Sorry, I don't want, I'm sorry, but my button's open. I don't want the woman to swoon because of my hairy chest. Dig if you will, the picture. Smoking. All right. All right. First Corinthians 12, verse 3. I was imitating Prince right there. And ironically, Prince was a Jehovah Witness. Dig, if you will, the picture. You and I engage in a kiss. Yep, he was a Jehovah Witness. Now, catch another thing they do with the Bible. Notice two things. Nobody can, nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by Holy Spirit. Notice two things. Number one. There is no definite article before, before Holy Spirit. It doesn't say except by the Holy Spirit. Number two, notice the H and the S is lowercase. The lowercase H, lowercase S. I will do a session using the Jehovah's Witness Bible to prove the Holy Spirit is a person. Right? But did you notice that? Did you catch it? No the before Holy Spirit. And the H and the S in Holy Spirit, lowercase. Lowercase H, lowercase S. You caught it? Now, do you need more proof that this Bible is diabolical, satanic? That you know Satan has his fingerprints all over this Bible because this Bible goes out of its way to attack all the core doctrines of the Christian faith. This is perhaps the most diabolical satanic Bible in the market. Because there are Bibles that you can see Satan's influence. This one is the most blatant. With me so far? Because I'm trying to help you understand how to use their Bible, how not to use their Bible. Uh, Kel London, don't pontificate here because I'm going to muzzle you like a dog and embarrass you. So shut your mouth and listen. Jesus is your God and your judge. Live with it. Okay. Now, let me show you another example of tampering with the Bible. Okay. One example. This is all part of the session to teach you how to most effectively witness to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Because you want to see them get saved, right? Or you believe that Jesus didn't come to save Jehovah's Witnesses. He only came to save your family and your church. Jesus came to save the world. That includes the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Muslims, the Hindus, the atheists. So let's be used of Christ to bring the people to the feet of Jesus because worthy is the Lamb to receive the reward of his suffering. Kiel, I'm going to make you look like a barking dog and humiliate you. Okay? You're lucky that they blocked you. You... you you really, anyway, I don't want to insult dogs. Dogs are cleaner than you and better than you. I'm going to have to apologize to all the dogs. I'm saying I'm sorry to compare such wicked, evil demons of the devil and put them on your level. Sorry, Snoopy. 
Sorry. <clears throat> What's his name? Scooby Doo. Well, also, I don't mean to insult them. They're cleaner than these than these demons. Now, with that said, let me show you another way they pervert scripture. John three sixteen. John three sixteen. Yes, right. Rastro, yeah. Shaggy! Scooby! Shaggy! All right. John 3, 16. Watch this. Guys, see if you catch it. I want you to see where they, again, tampered with the original languages. Can you see it? Let's see who's going to catch it in this translation. For God loved the world so much <clears throat> that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone exercising faith in him by not be destroyed, but have everlasting life. Who caught it? Who caught it? Who caught the deliberate manhandling of the Greek? Nope, it's not destroyed. No, guys, come on. You're not seeing it? Try it again. For God so loved the world. For God, say that's King James. Loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone exercising faith, exercising faith. Do you know why? The society teaches you must exercise faith. What is exercising faith? You must do the things that the society tells you to do and perhaps Jehovah will be pleased enough to give you immortality. Exercising faith. Not whoever believes in him or has faith in him. Whoever is exercising faith. So, uh, Jehovah Witness, how do I exercise faith? Doing what the society tells you to do. You got it? That's the King James. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You guys caught it there? So you ask the Jehovah's Witness, what does it mean to exercise faith? If you have faith, then you're going to exercise faith, right? <clears throat> Put it in practice by doing what the society teaches you. Another one, Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9. I hope you're learning about this cult, what they believe, and about their perverted Bible. Okay. I'll explain that in a minute, Zena. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. Notice their translation. By this undeserved kindness, you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing, rather it is God's gift. No, it is not the result of work, so that no one should have grounds for boasting. Now, believe it or not, this one caught me off guard. It's rather impressive. Hmm. Now, well, yes, this one, they didn't drop the ball. I'm, I'm impressed. Here they impressed me, folks. I got to admit, I thought they tampered with this, but quite impressive. Notice that they translated grace as undeserved kindness because a lot of people don't know what grace means. So they're giving you the meaning of the Greek, right? Because even when you say grace, a lot of people don't know. Pretty impressive. Here, Joe, witnesses, you get a thumbs up. But here, let me show you John 11, 25, 26. John 11, 25, 26. Okay. John 11, 25, 26. Watch here. And then the Jehovah Witness Bible. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection life, the one who exercises faith in me. Even though he dies, will come to life. And everyone who is living and exercises faith in me. So it's like an aerobic dance class. One more. Two more. Three more. exercises faith in me will never die at all. Do you believe this? So folks, you got to do some spiritual aerobics. It's exercise. One more. One more prayer. One more verse. One more door. One more pamphlet. That's right. Come on. You can do it. <laughs> you 
Do I have mental issues or what? Boy, this shirt needs to get washed. Woo! Thank goodness I'm single because if I was not married. She'd pass out from the smell. I thought I washed it. Woo -wee! Woke me up. Okay. Exercise faith. Now, another thing I want you to know how pathetically sad this religion is. It should break your heart, honestly. Even though we're having fun, we don't want to have fun at the expense of the Jehovah's Witness salvation. It should break your heart. There's about 8 million people who bought into this wicked satanic system. It should make you sad. Sad. There are people who actually believe this is Jehovah's organization, this is Jehovah's Bible, and this is Jehovah's path to be saved. They've been deceived, and you are the one that God can use to bring them out of their deception by the power of the Holy Spirit. Two more things, because this I need, to, need you to know what they believe, right? Because I'm giving you bits and pieces through each, each session. Did you know the Joe's Witnesses celebrate the Eucharist or what others would call the Lord's Supper only once a year? Do you know when? On the eve of Passover. When the Jews celebrate Passover, that's when the Joe's Witnesses will have the Lord's Supper. Others call it Eucharist. But here's where it gets sad. You want to really get sad? It's only once a year on the eve of Passover when the Jews celebrate. Because they'll tell you that's when Jesus celebrated it. Jesus celebrated the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper on the eve of the Jewish Passover. So we do it on that same eve once a year like Jesus. That's what they'll tell you. Okay. But here's what's sad. Are you ready to see what's sad? Are you ready to see what's sad? If you're not part of the 144,000, you can only look at the cup and the bread, but you can't drink or eat it. So they only pass it on. They look at it and pass it on. Only those who are part of the 144,000 can drink and eat of it. Did you know that? Only those that are part of the anointed class can eat and drink. The Lord's Supper. And I want you this year, Passover is coming up. Can you do me a favor? Please do me a favor. Find your local Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall. Tell them, I want to attend your, Paso uh, your Passover celebration. And they'll say, sure. It's going to come up on the eve of the Passover, which is a couple of months away. So I don't want you to take my word for it. Go there and sit and observe. You'll see. They'll pass the cup. They're only going to look at it. Pass the bread. They only look at it. And he asked them, how come none of you are eating or drinking? They'll tell you because this was given only to the anointed class, whoever is part of the 144,000. You get my point? How pathetically sad, heartbreaking this society is. It turns out to be. You get my point? So, even though we laugh, for the 8 million Joe's Witnesses who've been raised in this religion, it's not a joking matter. It's heartbreaking. So may the Spirit break your hearts for all of them, for all the lost, and ask the Spirit, use me to save these people out of this satanic system. Right? Right? Now, the final thing to confirm what I said earlier, without the Holy Spirit, no one can get saved. Let's now look at one pa more passage from their translation. John 16, 7 to 11. I hope all this blessed you, this information refreshed you, the prayer that we began with to the triumph God blessed you because I want to bless you and give you me. That's why I'm doing it slowly, systematically, methodically. Right? Now read. Notice how important the Holy Spirit is in bringing about salvation. Without the Spirit using your words, using you, you can't save anyone. Now watch here. Let's read. John 16, 7 to 11. Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I'm going away. 
For if I do not go away, the helper, notice it's lowercase h. You see how they insult the Holy Spirit? Lowercase h again. Will not come to you. But if I do go, I will send him to you. Now watch what the Holy Spirit will do. And when that one comes, he will give the world convincing evidence concerning sin, concerning righteousness, and concerning judgment. Who will convince the world? Convict the world? They're sinners and need to believe in Jesus in order to be righteous or they'll stand condemned? The helper, the Holy Spirit. Then he breaks it down. Read with me from 9 to 11. First, concerning sin, because they are not exercising faith in me. You see it again? Exercising faith in me. So what Jesus is saying is, it's the spirit that has to convict someone, you're in sin because you don't believe in Jesus. You'll die in sin if you don't believe in Jesus. You'll be condemned to hell if you don't believe in Jesus. That's the role, the work of the Holy Spirit. Now let's read 10 to 11. 10 to 11, okay? Watch here. Then concerning righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you'll see me no longer. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. Then concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Okay, what does he mean, the ruler of this world has been judged? The Holy Spirit will be the one to convince people Jesus' death has marked the destruction and judgment of Satan. His death on the cross and resurrection <clears throat> marks the end of the rule of Satan so that his fate is sealed. It's inevitable. He'll be condemned to hell. And now Satan has no power to accuse us anymore because Jesus took the debt of our sin, leaving Satan powerless to excuse us because every time Satan says, look at the sin he committed, Jesus says, it's been paid by my blood. He belongs to me. He's acquitted. You cannot bring any charges against him or her anymore. You are powerless to accuse them, and you stand condemned. Clear? Before I move on? You understand what it means? Satan stands condemned by what Jesus has done. Because Satan's weapon against humans is the law. What do I mean? And I'm going to do a session on this, but here I want to whet your appetite. According to the Bible, Satan's power against you is the law of God. Everyone listening now? Everyone listening? Satan's power against you is God's righteous, holy law. How can he use the righteous, holy Spiritual, perfect law of God against you because you break it. Because you break the law, God says the soul that sins shall die. And what is sin? Breaking the law. Every time you sin, Satan is there as the prosecuting attorney saying, see, he broke your law. And if you're righteous and holy, you got to do what you said will be done. He has to die. If you're really holy, you got to condemn them to hell. You get it? You understand what Satan's doing? Satan is using God's own law and his own word against him. Wait, God, you're holy, righteous, and judge, uh, just, and you cannot lie. You don't change your mind. You said whoever breaks your law dies. He broke your law. She broke your law. Condemn them if you're really holy. Condemn them if you're really holy. And that's where Jesus steps in. He goes, wait. I paid their debt. Their sins have been paid for by my death in their place. So God's justice has been satisfied. You have no power to accuse them anymore because they've been freed from the condemnation of the law by the blood of my cross. You get it now? You understand? Romans 8 verse 1. In the Jehovah Witness Bible. Romans 8 verse 1. 
Let me show you. The Jehovah's Witness Bible, because they're using their Bible against them. Not right now, Walter Jesus. You want me to go off topic? Why do you keep doing that, brother? Therefore, those in union with Christ Jesus have no condemnation. Therefore, those in union with Christ Jesus have no condemnation. Romans 8, 31 to 34. Romans 8, 31 to 34. I hope this is blessing you because you're learning so much about the Jehovah's Witnesses, their Bible, and learning about your faith. We're killing several birds with one stone through these series. Thank the Holy Spirit for moving us to do this, these series. Okay, Romans 8, 31 and 34. What then are we to say about these things? God, guys, read in their own translation. If God is for us, who will be against us? If God is for you and he's acquitted you and paid the debt of your sin and he's now lavished on you the salvation of Christ, who then can condemn you when the judge, jury, and executioner, they're all on your side because the judge, jury, and executioner are Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And they've acquitted you when you turn to Jesus. Now, Romans 8, 32. Since he did not even spare his own son, but handed him over for us all. Will he not also, along with him, kindly give us all other things? And I'll come back to that in a moment. Lisa, let's not get into the differences in the denominations, and I'll understand these passages, because now you're going to start an in-house debate among Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, and here we go off topic. Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! Okay, Romans 8, 32, since he did not even spare his own son, but handed him over for us all, will he not also, along with him, kindly give us all other things? I'll come back and explain what that means. But Romans 8, 33, 34, who will file accusation against God's chosen ones? God is the one who declares them righteous. Who will condemn them? Christ Jesus is the one who died. Yes, more than that, the one who was raised up, was at the right hand of God who also pleads for us. Now, let me explain what Romans 8, 33, 34 just said. How can anyone accuse you when God himself has acquitted you and has declared you righteous? How can anyone condemn you to death for your sins when Jesus died for your sins and now he's alive to intercede for you? So you have the judge acquitting you and you have the greatest defense attorney who can never lose a case and never lost a case and will never lose a case, Jesus Christ. Because the judge is his father. Did you catch it? You understand what it's saying here? Did it sink? I want to make sure it sinks in before I move on. Paul said, who can accuse you? God the Father has declared you righteous. He's acquitted you. Who can condemn you to die? Jesus died for your sin. And he's been raised to intercede. Please, you know what that means? Anytime Satan says, yeah, that netta, look, look at her mouth. Look what's coming out. Jesus says, silence. The debt of her sin has been paid. I died in her place. She's been acquitted. You can't accuse her anymore. Get behind me. You understand what you're reading? Did it sink in? This is the Jehovah Witness Bible. Okay. Now let me explain Romans 8.32. Let me explain Romans 8.32. Let's look at it one more time. Exactly, Michala. Romans 8.32. Watch. 
Watch what happens here. In the Jehovah's Witness Bible, we're waiting for our brother before the rapture. Since he did not even spare his own son, but handed him over for us all, will he not also along with him kindly give us all other things? Now, you know what he means by here? If God the Father gave up the one person he loves and adores more than anything, the only other one that he loves and adores just as much as the Son is the Spirit. The Father loves and adores the Son and the Spirit. He's in love with them. If God the Father gave up one of the two that he loves and adores more than anything, his Son, do you then think he's not going to give you everything else? He gave you his absolute best, most precious treasure, his very Son, his very heart. Everything else pales in comparison. So you think he's not going to give you immortality? You think he's not going to give you the world as a possession? When that's nothing in comparison to what he already has given up for you? This is an argument from the greater to the lesser. God has given you the absolute most precious person to his heart along with the spirit. He's given you his son. Everything else pales in comparison. So if God was willing to give you his best, you would better believe he's going to give you everything else. You understand Paul's logic? Everyone understanding his logic here? Thank you, Maureen. Pray. Is it sinking in before I move on? Because I want to make sure that you understand it. And you can use it this in any Bible, but you're seeing how you can use the Joe's Witness Bible to prove your case. Right? Now, what does John 16 10 mean? What does that mean? John 16, verse 10. And I'm going to show you Jesus in the Old Testament silencing Satan's accusations against one of God's elect. I'm going to show you that right after this in their Bible. Then concerning righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you will see me no longer. Now, let me explain what Jesus means here. The Holy Spirit will be the one to convince people of this righteous thing. He'll do it. Without the Spirit, you won't be convinced. Notice it says that the Spirit will convince the world of righteousness. And he explains what that is. Because I'm going to the Father and you'll see me no longer. Let me explain what he means. As far as the world is concerned, the world of unbelievers... At the time of Jesus, even now, for example, a Bart Ehrman or a Tovia Singer, they think when Jesus was killed on the cross, that either because he deserved it or it was simply a human being who posed a threat to the powers and they just got rid of him. And end of story. End of story. There goes Jesus. He's dead and gone. What Jesus is saying is, it will be the Spirit to show you, I didn't die on the cross for any sin I committed, for any crime I committed, or because the powers that be overcame me. I died to save you. I died in your place to take your punishment, not because I'm wicked. I died because you're wicked. I died in order to pay for your sin because I'm righteous. And here's the proof. I didn't die for any crime or sin of my own. God raised me to life, made me immortal, and now I dwell in the presence of God. Proving I didn't die because I'm a criminal. But who will convince you of that? That Jesus is righteous and he didn't die because of any unrighteousness? The Holy Spirit. You with me there? Who will convince the world Jesus is righteous, pure, and sinless? He's not a sinner. He's not wicked. He's not an insurrectionist who tried to lead a revolt against Rome. He's not a false messiah. He is the righteous and holy one and didn't die for any sins he committed, but for our sins to save us. And God then proved that he's righteous and that he honored his son and accepted his sacrifice by raising him back to life. Never to die again. The Holy Spirit. 
are you now seeing just how important the Holy Spirit is in convincing people of the truth of the Bible, the truth of Christ, the truth of Christianity, and how important the Holy Spirit is in changing you spiritually to become like Christ, in uniting you to Christ, and preserving you faithful in Christ. So notice, God the Father gave you the two persons that He loves and adores more than anything, the Son and the Spirit. He gave you His Son on the cross and His Spirit to live in you, to transform you, to teach you, to preserve you, to perfect you, to love you. Did it sink in? Did it sink in for everyone? Let me repeat again. The Father gave you the two persons He loves and adores more than anything, anyone. The two persons who are His heart. His Son on the cross, which Jesus voluntarily accepted. Yes, Father, I'll go to the cross because I love and adore all that you love and adore. And His beautiful Holy Spirit to now live in you, teach you, correct you, perfect you, set you apart, and preserve you. Did it sink in? Notice again, it's a triune work. Notice again, it's the Trinity. There's no fourth person or fifth person. It's God, Jesus, and the Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Are you seeing the Trinity? Notice there's not a fourth person or a fifth person. It's only these three and these three alone. Is that a coincidence? Or is that why we're Trinitarians? Because the God who loves us, who made us, creates us, sustains us, provides for us, saves us, is triune. Being blessed. Is this blessing you? Oops. Sorry. And you know, you know what should amaze you more? You know what should amaze you more? This is the Jehovah's Witness Bible. This is the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Even through their perversion of the Bible, you still see the Trinity. It comes out clearly. Right? Now let me show you Jesus defending the people of God even in the Old Testament before he became flesh against Satan. Are you ready? For an Old Testament revelation of Jesus, our defense attorney, defending God's people against Satan, even in the Old Testament. You ready? I want to know if you're ready. <clears throat> now, here's what you need to do. You need to go on my YouTube channel, look for the series I did, Angel of God in the Old Testament. I did two parts on it, I believe. The Angel of God in the Old Testament. And then go to answeringislam.net, look for my articles on the Trinity in the Old Testament, the Angel of the Lord. And also look for Anthony Rogers' articles on answeringislam.net on the Angel of the Lord, Malach Yahweh, and a series on the Angel of the Lord on David Wood's YouTube channel because we give you ample proof, even from the Jehovah's Witness Bible, the angel of God in the Old Testament is not a creature. He's called an angel because an angel is a messenger. He's the messenger sent by God, so he's distinct from God, but he happens to be God, does things that only God can do, claims to be God, and is worshipped as God, and even God acknowledges he's God. And we've given you ample proof that angel is Jesus Christ appearing in the Old Testament before he became flesh. I will do a series from the Jehovah Witness Bible proving that, okay? I will do a series proving that the angel of Jehovah in the Old Testament is not a creature. He is God Almighty who becomes Jesus Christ, and I'll use the Jehovah Witness Bible to prove it. You want me there? So I can't give you all that evidence for now. But I want to show you this angel is Jesus before he became flesh 
And he's not a creature. He's God Almighty who can do only what God does. With that said, let's now look at Zechariah 3, verses 1 to 2 in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Okay. In the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Are you ready? Zechariah 3, verses 1 to 2. Okay, read with me. Right here, sorry. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of Jehovah. Now notice how many figures in this vision. Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of Jehovah, and Satan was standing at his right hand to resist him. Okay, angel... Joshua, Satan, only three. Guys, one more time. Angel, Joshua, Satan, only three in heaven. This is a heavenly vision. He's seeing a heavenly vision. Then the angel of Jehovah said to Satan, May Jehovah rebuke you, O Satan. Yes, may Jehovah, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is not this one, God bless you, brother. Is not this oh, one a burning log snatched out of the fire? Now let me explain what the angel just did. The angel said, shame on you, Satan. How dare you bring an accusation against Joshua when he is a burning log safe from destruction. In other words, when God destroyed Jerusalem, God in his mercy spared Joshua, meaning that Joshua is forgiven. Since he's forgiven, safe from destruction, how dare you try to condemn him? Shut your mouth. You have no accusation against him. He's forgiven. You understand what the angel just did? The angel interceded and defended a man of God. Sound familiar? Who does this sound like? He just came to the defense of Joshua against Satan, silencing Satan, saying you have no grounds to condemn him anymore. Who didn't get it? It's like you're silent. Does that sound familiar? Did everyone get it? Okay, now, now, no, now watch what the angel is going to say right after that. Zechariah 3, verses 3 and 4. Zechariah 3, verses 3 and 4. Watch this. Here's where you're going to get blown away. Zechariah 3, verses 3 and 4. Right after he silenced Satan, notice what the angel says. Now Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and standing before the angel. Filthy garments represents his sins. Verse 4. Watch here. The angel said to those standing before him. Now notice the angel's commanding angels. He has power to command them in heaven. In heaven. He says to the others standing before him, remove his filthy garments. Remove his sins. Now notice what the angel says. Then he said to him, See, I have caused your error to pass away from you, and you'll be clothed with fine garments. Wait, wait, wait. Who do you think you are, angel? You just removed his sins and clothed him in robes of righteousness, and you said, See, I caused your errors to be removed. I removed your sins so that Satan could no longer accuse you so that God can forgive you. Who do you think you are, angel of God? God bless you, Sahih, metaphor. Did you catch it? The reason why Satan couldn't condemn him, right? The reason why Satan couldn't condemn him, because God in his mercy forgave him. But guess who did the forgiveness? The angel. The angel says to the other angels, remove his filthy garments, remove his sins. He has no sins. He's been forgiven. Clothe him in righteousness. And the angel then says to, uh, to Joshua, see, I have caused your errors to be removed. I have removed your sins. Who didn't get it? Who didn't get this? Who didn't understand this? Come on, medic. 
you're going to kill me with these questions. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Why can't one person of the Godhead rebuke someone in the name of the other person of the Godhead? Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Hey, Salah, Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Okay. Let me repeat this to medic. And I, I, I know sometimes I make him feel bad. He's like, man, I wish I didn't ask the question. It's okay, medic. It's okay if I pull your leg and, and you know, beat you down and make you feel worthless only to build you up again. See, what I do is I tear you down, make you feel worthless only to build you up again with love. Okay. Medic, why can't one person of the Godhead rebuke someone in the name of the other person of the Godhead? Do you believe the angel is the father? No. So why can't the angel rebuke Satan in the name of Jehovah, whose messenger he happens to be, and then claim to do what only Jehovah God does, forgive sins? So now notice what you're missing. Old Testament proof for multiple divine persons. You have one person, the angel, rebuking Satan in the name of another person who is God. Showing he's not the same person. Destroying modalism. Showing that the Old Testament is Trinitarian. Showing modalism is alive the devil. Because already you have distinct divine persons in the Old Testament interacting. So here's the divine angel rebuking Satan in the name of Jehovah. Whose messenger he happens to be. And then he says, I remove your sins. Because like Jehovah, whose messenger he is, he is one with them and therefore God. So why would you not see it as a glorious truth? There's more than one divine person who is God, even in the Old Testament, which now destroys modalism for the satanic doctrine it is. Right? Yes, that's good. Yes. Medic, you don't run to Jude chapter 1 verse 9 to show that Michael rebuked Satan in the name of the Lord because Michael knew enough that to oppose Satan by his authority and oppose it on this passage when in the context the angel does something that no creature can do, not even Michael, forgive sins, remove sins. You focused on the wrong part. Jehovah rebuked you, but you forgot the next part. I have caused your errors to be removed. I removed your sins, meaning I can't forgive sins, something only God can do. You catching it now or no? Okay. Now, now let me show you I can turn this argument against you if you were an anti-Trinitarian. Okay, let me show you. Let me show you how now I can use your objection that the angel rebukes Satan in the name of Jehovah, whose angel he is, and use that similar objection to show that Jehovah can't be God because the angel is doing something, not Jehovah. What do I mean? Let's go to Exodus 23, 20 to 21. Exodus 23, 20 to 21. Okay. I am sending an angel ahead of you. This is Jehovah speaking. Pay attention, medic. I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you on the way and to bring you into the place that I have prepared. Pay attention to him. Wait, Jehovah, why don't you say pay attention to me and obey his voice? Why not obey your voice, Jehovah? Do not rebel against him for he will not pardon your transgressions for my name is in him. Jehovah, you're confusing me. Why won't he forgive them? Why don't you say you won't forgive them? Why are you deferring to someone else? See, that's the kind of question you're asking me. God bless you, Danium. May you stay out of Joe's witnesses and be a follower of the true triumph God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You get my point? That's what you asked me. So I can ask uh, that. Jehovah, why are you having the angel forgive? Why don't you simply say, I won't forgive you? Why are you deferring it to him? 
Because that's how the members of the Godhead talk and interact with one another. So Jesus could say, I won't accuse you. The Father will accuse you. And God could say, listen to the angel or he won't forgive you. That's why you're Trinitarian. So what's the problem? Where's the problem for the Trinitarian? Yep. The angel of the Lord, his name is Jehovah, God, the Word, the Son. So when you say he has no name, what you meant to say, he doesn't have a name of a creature. Because the angel of the Lord is Jehovah. He is God. He is God Almighty. He's the mighty God. He is the Word of God. He is the Son of God. Right? Yeah. Well, not secret. No, no, no. Pins and needles. Needles and pins. Judges 13, 18. The word pali means it is beyond comprehension. It is beyond understanding. It's wonderful. Lopez, that's the same word from which we get wonderful counselor. The word wonderful counselor, Isaiah 9, 6. The word wonderful is from Pele which comes from the same word in Judges 13, 18, Pali. The angel says, my name is too wonderful beyond understanding. And if the child is born, he is wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God. Here, Judges 13, 18. The angel tells, guys, you should know this because I did a series on the angel of God. It's all in my series. I went through Judges 13, 18. Let's look at Judges 13, 17 to 18. Judges 13, 17 to 18. Let's look at it. It's Hebrew Protestant, by the way. Watch here. It's not secret, meaning, ooh, it's wonderful. Here. Then Manoah said to Jehovah's angel, what is your name? Now, Manoah didn't know it was the angel of Jehovah. He thought it's a man, a human messenger of God. So he asked this man who turns out to be Joe's angel, he says, what is your name? So that we may honor you when your word comes true. Now notice what he says. However, Jehovah's angel said to him, why are you asking about my name, seeing that it is a wonderful one? Wonderful one means, don't ask about my nature. My nature, my name, is beyond understanding. It's too wonderful for you to comprehend. That's why the NIV renders it as, Beyond understanding. Can you put Judges 13, 18 in the NIV? Watch here. NIV, Judges 13, 18. Look at the lexicon, Lopez. The root for the word pali, pele, means beyond understanding. Too wonderful. Beyond imagination. So what this angel was saying is, don't try to figure out my nature, my characteristics, my being. Because I'm beyond your ability to understand. Only God can say that. Now, Protestant or first last, quote Judges 13, 18 in the NIV. I hope you're learning a lot, folks. Still using Joe Witness Bible to prove the Trinity. Exactly, Lisa. It means it's ineffable. Right. Okay, I'm just waiting for someone. Okay, NIV. Do you see it now? Notice the NIV, how it translates the Hebrew. He replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. Folks, how can the angel of Jehovah say, my name, which means my nature, my being, is beyond understanding if he's a creature? How can a creature say, I'm beyond understanding? No creature can. So why did the angel of God, who appeared as a man, Manoah thought he was just a man, he didn't know it was the angel of God, say, don't ask about my name, it's beyond understanding. It's too wonderful for you. If he's a creature, can he say that? No, he can't. Why did he say it? Because he's God appearing as a man, the messenger of God. 
In fact, going back to the Jehovah Witness Bible, going back to the Jehovah Witness Bible, Judges 13, 21 and 22. Judges 13, 21 and 22. This is the Jehovah Witness Bible. Jehovah's angel did not appear again to Manoah and his wife. Now, note, folks, note, folks, verse 21. Zee and everyone else, pay attention to what 21 says. Then Manoah realized that he was Jehovah's angel. Notice what it didn't say. Manoah realized that was Jehovah. He knew that was the angel of Jehovah. He knew it. He figured out that man was the angel of Jehovah. But then explain to me his response in 22. Manoah then said to his wife, we are sure to die because it is God whom we have seen. So the Jehovah Witness Bible got it right. It left it capital G. It is God whom we have seen. Wow. Uh, Mr. Jehovah Witness, the text says that was a man, right, who was the angel of Jehovah. So the angel of Jehovah appeared in visible form, in human form as a man. It says Manoah knew it was the angel. But then Manoah said, we saw God when we saw that man who's the angel. Why did Manoah call that angel, appeared as a man, God? And now he's afraid because he knew to see God is to bring death. Latin. I would expect that you don't chime in too much, brother, so you can pay attention and follow along. Because now you're going to make me waste time on shutting down that argument. You cannot identify the agent as the one he represents because according to that stupid response, even though you're not giving that response as a Joe witness, since Paul was Jesus's agent, I could call Paul, oh my goodness, I saw Paul, meaning I saw Jesus Christ, the son of God. So don't try to play the Joe witness role because I will shut it down and I don't want to waste time on things I've already addressed. So speak Latin so I don't get... Side track. Okay. Did you understand that now? Is it clear from the Jehovah Witness Bible? Is it clear? We got to send Latin out of here. Bye-bye, Latin. I want you to go back to Rome and observe the Latin Mass. This is not for you, this channel. Okay. Is it clear, even from the Jehovah Witness Bible, the angel of Jehovah, medic, why are you unhiding him? Ahmedic, you're going to get blocked too. Is it clear from the Jehovah Witness Bible that the angel of Jehovah is not a creature? They knew he is God. They called him God. So he is the visible appearance of God. And he does things that only God can do, forgive sins, from the Jehovah Witness Bible. Did you get it? I like George. Did you guys get it or no? Okay. Since we're on the angel and it's a part of the Trinity, this is still part of the series. I'm still proving the Trinity from the Jehovah's Witness Bible. We're still on the same topic. So we're not going off topic. Okay. Okay, now, one more time, Judges 13, 18. I'm going to give you the link to the Hebrew. Because I want to show you something. And here, I'm going to show you that even the Jews made the connection. Even the Jews made the connection. Here's what I want you to do. Okay. You see that word? It is a wonderful one. Okay. Click on that link. It is a wonderful one. Okay. Lisa, if God gives me health, keeps me healthy and holiness and purity to love him and delight his heart and saves me from this judge, removes her completely so I can be free and at peace, I will write these books by the grace of God's spirit before the Lord takes me home, if he's pleased or before he turns. But I'm going through for two years. I've been in shackles. Actually, 10 years, but now two years, a legal system that's so corrupt of the devil. I need freedom. I really do. And I also need the Lord to bring my daughters, if he's pleased to, sooner than later. Because I'm letting you know, folks, I'm very lonely, humanly speaking. 
here, I'm basically by myself. People have families, they work, they're busy, right? So anyway, I'm not trying to appeal to pity. Now, Judges 13, 18. Judges 13, 18. Click there. Guys, I want you to see the word wonderful. You see it's Pali. Does everyone see it? Pali. Okay. You see it, right? Just c confirm that you see it. Thank you, Riaz. God bless you, brother. Good to see you, man. You guys see it? I will, Lopez, in time. That's why I can't respond to you, Lopez, when you ask me, because I'm not out of my trials yet. When I am, I'll let you know, God willing. Okay. Now, did everyone see the word is Pali? Before I, I move on, a lot of meat today. Praise the triumph God. Everyone see the word Pali? I can't move on if you don't see it. Okay. I want you to do an Abdel Halaj, my precious brother, who knows Hebrew, is going to confirm this. I want you to click on that word. It's going to take you to the word and how many times it appears. Okay. How many times it appears. So here's the link. So you go there, Pali. You go there, click the link, and it shows you it only appears one time in that exact form. In that exact form, it appears one time. But then you click Strong's Hebrew 6383, right? 6383, right? <clears throat> when you go to Strong's Hebrew 6383, okay, Lisa, when you have time later on, you can go back and check it out. Click on that, so you go to Strong's, so you don't need to be a Hebrew scholar. You'll see NAS Exhaustive Concordance. It says word origin from the same as Pele. Pele. Do you see it? Everyone see it? Pele. There you go. Okay, that's right there. NAS Exhaustive Concordance. Okay, folks, you're getting it? Okay. You click on Pele, right? Click on Pele. Here's the link. Click on Pele, folks. Guess what you find on your right? If you go to your right, you're going to see that this word, Pele, where you get Pali, Pali and Pele, right? Come from the same root, basically have the same meaning. You go down. And you'll find Isaiah 9, verse 6. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and he shall be called wonderful. That's the Hebrew word. The child born, the son given, he is the wonderful counselor, mighty God, El Gibor. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Folks, make the connection. The angel of God is wonderful. The child born is wonderful. The angel of God is God appearing in human form as a man. So Manoah said, we've seen God when we saw the angel. The child born is the mighty God being born as a man. Everyone getting the connection? In other words, you can now make a strong case. The angel of God, who is God that appears as a man, who is wonderful, becomes the child born, who not only now appears as a man, but becomes a man, a human baby, a human man, who is the wonderful counselor of the mighty God. So the angel appeared as a man, but then becomes a man, taking on the nature of a man. In the Old Testament, he appeared as a man, didn't become man. But now he becomes a man when he's born as a human child. It's the same person. Did you get it? In other words, Isaiah 9 is telling you, the child born, who's a son given, who sits on David's throne, is none other than the angel of Jehovah. That child is the angel of God, 
who appeared to me and my ancestors in human form as a man who is God. So when you see him, you see God. Now he'll be born as a human baby. So what was an appearance here, he then actually becomes by nature. He appeared human, he becomes human. Thank you, Daniel. And Cass, thank you for your, for your gifts. God bless you. No, NIV would translate it wonderful counselor, but that's what it means. Everyone got it so far? Everyone got it so far? God bless you, medic. See you hopefully soon. And you can go back and re-listen to this. So that's the beauty of, of YouTube. Okay, you get it? Now, let me show you something that's going to blow your mind even more. It's going to blow your mind even more. The Jews translated the Old Testament into Greek for those Jews who couldn't read or write Hebrew or Aramaic. The Greek translation done by Jews is often more of a paraphrase where they give you the meaning of the verse as opposed to a little translation. How did the Jews translate Isaiah 9-6 in Greek? How did the Jews translate Isaiah 9-6 in Greek? God bless you, Calvin. Okay, here you go. Guys, get ready to be blown away. Most of you already heard this in the past because I mentioned it. So did Anthony Rogers. But some of you may be hearing it for the first time. Okay. Let me see if I can get all of it. Here you go. Here you go. Notice how the Jews translated Isaiah 9, 6 in Greek. For a child is born to us and a son is given to us whose government is upon his shoulder and his name is called the messenger of great counsel. Guess what the word messenger is in Greek? Angel. The child is the angel of the great counsel. Here, let me give you the Greek. Magelis, Boeles, Angelos. Magelis, Boeles, Angelos. Magelis, Boeles, Angelos. The word Angelos is where you get the word angel translated messenger. Folks, are you catching this or did I put you to sleep? The Greek translation of Isaiah 9, done by Jews, identifies the child as the angel of the great council. And the word council there can mean either in wisdom or the heavenly council. You understand what I just told you? You understand what that means? The Jews identified that child as the angel of Jehovah, the angel of God, being born as a human baby, becoming an actual human being. So I'm waiting for it to sink in before I move on to the next point. Anyone didn't get it? Z and everyone else, are you getting it? Sinking in? Jesus is that angel of God in the Old Testament. No wonder Jesus does what that angel does. The angel does what Jesus does. God bless you, Walter. Watch over and preserve you. I don't know if Zena is still here because she had some questions. I don't know if true Jesus is here. Before I move on, I got to make sure you're with me because it defeats the purpose if you don't get these points and you can't use them in your witness. Everyone getting it? Is there anyone not getting it? Even better. All right. If that's clear, all right. Do you see how much meat there is in the Jehovah's Witness Bible for the Trinity, for the angel being God and not a creature, for Jesus being God Almighty in the flesh? Thank you, Anna Groin. That blesses my heart coming from you. Thank you, sister. It means a lot. Okay. If you're getting it, and we got Zechariah 3, how Jesus as the angel was already refuting Satan, silencing Satan, 
condemning Satan and protecting God's elect. Jesus has been doing it from the time of the fall. You understand? Jesus has been defending the people of God from the time of Adam's fall against the accusations of Satan. He didn't start doing it after his death and resurrection and ascension. He's been doing it from the time of Adam's fall and will continue to do it till the end of the age. That's why Acts 17 Apologetics was here stalking me. Hater Wood has hope of being saved. If Jesus wasn't interceding for Hater Wood, he'd be the first to burn in hell. He'd be the fuel for the fire. Because you know, it's humanly impossible for someone like that to be saved. Which is why only God can save a loser like him. You with, you with me there? Almost done. So far you got all this meat? We covered a lot of ground, a lot of topics. We discussed a lot of issues, especially with Joe's witnesses. There's a lot of meat in this session. By the grace of the triune God, everything good, perfect from him. Okay? So now let me just give you the final point for tonight, God willing. Guys, pray. Pray for these dates. February 13, February 19. Pray for miraculous deliverance, for favor from the higher court. Pray for my move. I move into my place February 15. Pray for furniture, provisions, for my health and holiness, for strong internet connection for my daughters so I can be free to serve you until Jesus takes me home. All right? And you know, hater wood is proof of predestination. You know why? You know God had to predestine me to even like and love David Wood and to be willing to carry him all these years and make him the best apologist against Islam by having him steal my material and claim it as his own, and he gets rich, and he makes the money, and I'm starving and struggling, so are my kids, and carrying all that weight, now I have severe back problems. I'm going to need a back brace and a wheelchair. But that's because I was predestined to carry him. And Jesus is worthy, amen? I'll do it for the glory of Jesus. I'll carry this guy till I die, right? Because I have no choice. I was predestined. Okay, Hebrews 1, 2 to 3. Hebrews 1, 2 to 3. Let's end it with this. And remind me before I close it to share some links. An upcoming documentary by Patterns of Evidence providing more irrefutable archaeological historical proof for the historicity of Moses and the Exodus. Okay, guys, now here's where I want you to pay attention. Using the Joe witness against them. To prove Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh. Okay. Hebrews 1, 2 to 3. Okay, read with me. Now at the end of these days, he has spoken to us by means of a son. So God now speaks exclusively in and through the son, Jesus Christ. The son he appointed heir of all things. And through him, God the Father made the system of things through the son. Here's where I need you to pay attention to verse 3. You really need to pay attention to verse 3. Right? He is the Son, Jesus is, the reflection of God's glory and the exact representation of his very being. And he sustains all things by the word of his power. And after he had made a purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, let's look at Hebrews 1.3 again, the first part. Well, all of it, post it one more time. Guys, please make sure you get this argument and let me know that you got it. Because this is irrefutable. They won't be able to honestly refute this. They'll come up with something. But you're going to see how weak and dishonest the response is. Okay. Notice, not only is Jesus the reflection of God's glory, here's what I want you to pay attention. He's the exact <clears throat> representation of his very being. Okay. The word exact. And thank the Joe Witness for translating this way. Shake their hand and say, thank you, Joe Witness, for translating it as exact representation. Okay, The Greek word, even in their Greek interlinear, is character. 
where we get the word character. Character. Character, some would translate it this way, okay. <clears throat> means the exact imprint, the exact duplicate, the exact copy, the exact representation of something. You with me there? That's what the word means. The exact imprint, duplicate, copy, representation of something. Okay. This will blow your mind away. And I've actually addressed it in my series on Jesus not being the Archangel Michael. But we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature. Notice it says Jesus is the exact copy, the exact representation of God's being. Upo stasios. Okay, let me ask you a question. Is God's being uncreated? Is God's being infinite? And isn't it true that part of God's being is that he's all-powerful, all-knowing, present everywhere? So the being of God is uncreated, eternal, infinite, and part of his being includes God having to be all-powerful, all-knowing, present everywhere. But wait, how then can Jesus be the exact copy, duplicate, imprint, rep representation of God's infinite, almighty, uncreated being if Jesus is a creature? No creature can be the exact representation of of an infinite uncreated being because a creature is limited, temporal, and finite, and he cannot be the exact copy of God's infinite, almighty, uncreated being. But that's what Hebrews just said. Hebrews said, Jesus, his son, is the exact copy of God's being. Did it sink in? Everyone got it? But we have a problem, Jehovah Witness. Jehovah Witness, you tell me Jesus is the finite creature, the archangel Michael. They tap dance around in Zena. Try it. They'll tell you, no, it doesn't mean that. He's created. They tap dance around in Zena. But now, you tell me Jesus is the archangel Michael, a creature, and he's one of the sons of, the, of God, heavenly spirit sons of God who are created. Although he's the first. But Jehovah's Witness, I have a problem. Because in Psalm 89, 5 to 8, in your Bible, it says none of the sons of God resemble Jehovah. None of the sons of God are mighty like Jehovah. None of the sons of God are like Jehovah. Psalm 89, verses 5 to 8. The heavens praise your marvels, O Jehovah. Yes, your faithfulness in the congregation of the holy ones. Notice their Bible, verse 6. For who in the skies can compare to Jehovah? Answer, nobody. Who among the sons of God is like Jehovah? Answer, nobody. But wait, Jesus is. He's exactly like Jehovah. He's the exact copy of Jehovah's being. How could that be if he's a mere created spirit son of God? God is held in awe and the council of holy ones. He is grand and awe-inspiring to all who are around him. O Jehovah, God of armies, who is mighty like you? Nobody is. O Jah, your faithfulness surrounds you. Okay, now, Jehovah Witness, I'm really confused. None of the created spirit sons of God are mighty like Jehovah, resemble Jehovah, or are like Jehovah. None of them. Yes. But Jesus is exactly like God the Father, the exact copy of God's God the Father's infinite, uncreated being, and he's just as mighty as the Father is. How if Jesus is a created spirit son? You have a contradiction, Joe Witness, in your theology, because you just pit Hebrews against Psalms. Did you catch it? Now, where does it say Jesus is just as mighty as God? Let's go to Hebrews 1.3 again. 
Hebrews 1 3 again. Radioactive? No, that's not the case. You're now just made a comment again. You pontificated and you're wrong. And I don't have time to correct you. That's not why he appeared as an angel. Let's just leave it at that now. That's why I'm better off just listen to learn. Okay, now, how do I know Jesus is just as mighty as God the Father? For two, two reasons. Let's read Hebrews 1 3 again. He is the, ex the reflection of God's glory, the exact representation of his very being. Now, again, Part of God's being includes that he's almighty. If Jesus is the exact copy of God's being, that means whatever is part and parcel of God's being, Jesus possesses that quality. Well, part of God's being includes God being almighty. If Jesus is the exact copy of the being, that means he too must be almighty. So he's just as mighty as God. You with me there? You with me there? If he's not just as mighty as God, he can't be the exact copy of God's being because part of God's being includes he's almighty, omnipotent. But he is the exact copy of his being. Whatever his being is, Jesus possesses it in all its fullness. You catch it? The second line of evidence that shows me Jesus is just as mighty as God. Hebrews 1 3 again. Hebrews 1 3. Yep, first and last got it. Even in their Bible, even in their Bible, watch Hebrews 1 3. Watch what their Bible says. And he, the Son, sustains all things by the word of his power. What kind of power must the Son possess? To sustain all creation, all the heavens and the earth, everything in them, to sustain them, preserve them, give them life, and then guide them to God's intended goal for creation. And how can a mere creature sustain all creation when a mere creature is finite in power? And how can Jesus be a creature, sustain all creation? Is he also sustaining himself? Because if he's a creature and he's sustaining all things, that means he's sustaining himself. Folks, this was the Jehovah Witness Bible. Jehovah Witness Bible. I didn't even use an evangelical Bible or a Catholic Bible or an Orthodox Bible. I use the Jehovah Witness Bible. Is it clear that even from this perverted Bible, the sovereign, true, triune God, the risen Lord of glory, Jesus, has provided enough evidence, enough proofs in their Bible that God is triune and that Jesus is God in the flesh? No, he's not talking to me. Jojo, are you saying my argument is circular? No, he's not talking to me. He's talking to Joe Witness. Right? I hope he's not talking to me. If he is, let him clarify so I can school him too in love. Right? Clear? Everyone got it, right? According to the Old Testament, who sustains creation? Isaiah 42, verse 5. That's a circular argument. Jojo, you better prove it's circular. Because you're saying, to say a creature sustains all creation, are you saying they are being circular? Because that, I don't know what you're saying, Jojo. You're confusing me. A creature sustains creation means he's sustaining himself. See, I'm getting confused here. Because you're saying that's circular. No. You're saying the Jehovah Witness position becomes circular. That's what you're saying? Because I'm getting confused. So you confused all of us. Anyway, Isaiah 42, verse 5, Jojo. Jojo Dancer. Okay. Read this. Who sustains creation according to the Hebrew Bible? Isaiah 42, verse 5. Who sustains creation according to the Hebrew Bible? Notice, this is what the true God, Jehovah says. 
the creator of the heavens and the grand one who stretched them out, the one who spread out the earth and its produce, the one who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. You will not find anyone other than Jehovah in the Hebrew Bible that sustains creation. Jehovah alone sustains creation according to the Hebrew Bible. Hebrews 9, verse 6. I'm sorry, Nehemiah. Nehemiah 9, verse 6. Nehemiah 9, verse 6. Watch here. And we're done for tonight's session. You alone are Jehovah. You made the heavens. Yes, the heaven of the heavens. And all their army, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them alive. And the army of the heavens are bowing down to you. So Old Testament prophets, who sustains all creation and gives life? Jehovah. Is there a creature that helps Jehovah or that Jehovah uses to sustain creation? Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, Hebrews, yes. You're a Jew, right? In fact, tradition says you're Paul who used perhaps Luke to write Hebrews. Yes. You know the Old Testament, right? Yeah. You know the Old Testament says no spirit creature is like Jehovah, resembles Jehovah, and is mighty like Jehovah. Absolutely. And you know Jehovah alone sustains all things. Yes. So why are you saying the Son, who's not God the Father, is exactly like God, the exact copy of God's infinite being, and that the Son sustains all creation by his powerful word if he's a creature. And the author looks at me like this. Who told you he's a creature? He's God Almighty, distinct from the Father and the Spirit, one with them in essence, who became man and took on a nature of a creature, but he as a person is eternal, uncreated, almighty. Where did you get that I said he's a creature? But wait, Paul, the Joe's Witnesses told me he's a creature and that the anointed class of 144,000 are God's faithful, discreet servant to minister God's word correctly. Are you saying they're wrong, Paul? So then you pro you're not part of the 144,000, are you? So you are not part of the anointed class. <laughs> okay. You remember what Psalm 89 said? Eight. Hey, no spirit son of God is mighty like Jehovah, right? Psalm 89, 8. No spirit son of God is mighty like Jehovah, right? Right? Meaning created spirit son of God. A son of God who is a created spirit being, right? No one, right? Who is mighty like you, Ajah? Nobody. Let's end it with John 5.19. Let's end it with John 5.19. And I just have a few things to mention, and we'll, Lord willing, do a session tomorrow. John 5.19. Let's end it here. This is, in my estimation, the most accurate translation of John 5.19. It's so accurate, it's mind-boggling. -bo the Jehovah's Witnesses translated it correctly. What do I mean? Here's the Jehovah's Witness Bible. It is super accurate and amazingly accurate. And here's where it destroys their theology. Therefore, in response, Jesus said to them, Most truly I say to you, the Son cannot do a single thing of his own initiative, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever things that one does, these things the Son does also in like manner. Wow, how amazingly accurate this translation is. Two things. Jesus says he absolutely doesn't do a single thing on his own initiative. He can only do what the Father does. Whatever the Father does, he does in like manner. Folks, help me understand. How can a creature say he can only do what God does, and whatever God does, he does it in the same way? How can a creature say that? What creature says, I only do what God does? Because here the Father is God. And whatever the Father does, I do it in the same way he does it. No creature can say that because that would be a blasphemous lie. 
Many creatures do a lot of things God would never do. And no creature can do what God does in the way that God does them. But Jesus says, I, the son, that's all I can do. I can only do what he tells me to do. And I can only do what he does. And I do everything the same way he does them. Who do you think you are, Jesus of Nazareth? And you know what's funny, folks? Joe's witnesses will tell you, Jesus as a man had free will, and he could have exercised his free will to sin against God. John 5, 19 says, that's a lie. Because Jesus says, I cannot do a single thing on my own initiative. So even their translation destroys their theology because Jesus says, no way. I cannot do anything contrary to the Father. I can only do what he tells me to do and what he does. Destroying their false doctrine that Jesus as a man had free will to sin. And when I brought it up to a Jehovah Witness, one of the elders, and I asked the question, he goes, oh, no, no, he has free will. I said, but wait, it says he cannot do a single thing on his own initiative, meaning he can only do what God does. Where's the free will? He just looked at me, smiled. No, it doesn't mean that. It means he chooses not to disobey God. That's what it means. So they don't even accept the plain language of their own translation when it goes against what the society teaches. So let's end it. In a Trinitarian manner. John 5, 19, John 16, 13. Back to back. John 5, 19 and John 16, 13. Back to back. Watch here. Let's send it with the Trinity. And Zena, Lord willing, I'll answer your question on slavery either tomorrow or I'll text you. Because we went over time. Okay, watch here. Guys, pay attention. John 5, 19 and John 16, 13, back to back. Notice what Jesus says about himself, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Watch here. We're waiting for John 16, 13. Guys, read with me. Therefore, in response, Jesus said to them, Most truly I say to you, the Son cannot do, cannot do, cannot do, three times, a single thing of his own initiative, but only... Only, only, wow, what a powerful translation. Thank you, Jehovah's Witness, for translating John 5, 19 in the most accurate, powerful manner. Only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever things that one does, these things the Son does also in like manner. Now notice what he says about the Holy Spirit, folks. Let's end it with a glorious testimony to the perfect, inseparable bond and union of the Trinity. Notice what Jesus says about the spirit. Notice the blasphemy again. The S in spirit is lower, lowercase. However, when that one comes, the spirit of the truth, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak of his own initiative. But what he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you things to come. Wow, Jesus. You're saying even the spirit only speaks what you tell him to speak, what the Father Tells him to speak, and the Spirit does nothing on his own initiative like you? Yes, just like me. Why is that, Jesus? Because I and the Spirit are perfectly, eternally, inseparably united to the Father. We can only work in perfect union and can never work contrary to the other. That's why we are the glorious Trinity. Okay. Okay, now, guys, February 18, Phantom Events. Phantom Events will be screening in select theaters, and I found the theater in my neighborhood, February 18. The same gentleman that produced one of the most monumental documentaries called Patterns of Evidence, Evidence for the Exodus. He came up with two other parts. This man is a godsend because in that documentary, he examined skeptical scholars and then went to scholars, Egyptologists, 
who <clears throat> showed the overwhelming historical archaeological proof demonstrating the exodus took place, Joseph existed, the Jews were in Egypt and came out with signs and wonders. He showed the evidence that conservative scholars have known for centuries, but which liberal media and liberal scholars have been ignoring, setting aside, or hiding. Patterns of evidence and amazing testimony to how much evidence the true God has given for the historicity of Moses and the Exodus. Well, guess what he did? He came up with another part, patterns of evidence last year, providing historical archaeological proof that the Torah was written by Moses in a language other than Egyptian. And guess what he's doing now? Part three. February 18, patterns of evidence, evidence for the splitting of the Red Sea. He has now amassed archaeological proof that the Red Sea was the sea that Israel crossed and that there's archaeological proof that something miraculous happened to split it. And he's going to be airing part one of the third part in the documentary, February 18, Patterns of Evidence. Go there, support the documentary, learn the arguments, because God is now flooding the world with overwhelming historical, archaeological, textual, scientific proof. The Bible is his word. He is God. You better be ready to repent because Jesus is coming. Bejadid, you're a liar and you're a filthy dog and your mother should be put in jail for giving a birth to a dog like you, you low-life scum. Sorry, guys. That was just love flowing out of me. Okay? When these dogs come barking, I will muzzle you, you filthy dogs. I'm not like David Wood, pretends to be nice on camera to make money, but when the camera's off, he's the biggest jerk known to mankind. I'm a jerk on screen and off screen to blasphemers and filthy dogs. So here's the link. Go support the documentary. At least I'm consistent. I'm consistently rude on and off the camera, not like David Wood pretending to be a gentleman. I'm a gentleman and a scholar. And then when the camera's off, you big dummy, you fool, stupid, rain man, he justifies the hatred of the black Hebrew Israelites to the white man because he's that typical white man that they speak out against. But still, he's saved by grace. Niles, I think God is doing something miraculous. I don't want to speak presumptuously, so I'm trusting it is a sign from God. Niles, that agent of the devil in that court, she hasn't been in court for over a week. She wasn't there today. She won't be there tomorrow, and she's not on vacation. Something is happening and I'm trusting because God is answering your prayers. Keep praying and fasting. I'm trusting a miracle will take place. I'll have my daughters. Their mother will be convicted, broken, repentant before the feet of the Lord. God will save me from this corrupt judge and her <clears throat> corrupt decisions. Provide for me and my daughters. And open doors to take me higher levels to glorify him. Reach more people for the glory of Christ. To live for him, love him, and even die for him if necessary. And folks. Do pray specifically by name. Martin Simon Yako, and I hope my ex-wife is watching it. You have no business bringing men into the lives of my daughters. Pray, Lord, remove Martin Simon Yako. He's not their father. Protect them. Bring them to me. I'm their father, your servant, to raise them in the love of Jesus. So pray against that man to be shamed and convicted and to walk away. And the Lord convict her to stop bringing men into my children's lives. You want to do what you want? Keep it outside. Leave my daughters alone. Bring them to me in Jesus' name. Amen? Folks, I don't say this enough, but I'm going to repeat it. I thank God for you, the faithful ones who come and can tolerate me for the sake of the Lord. It is an honor to be used of Jesus to bless you and equip you by the Spirit because it rejoices my heart, makes my heart rejoice when I see you guys in love with Jesus in awe of Jesus and blown away how beautiful and deep and rich the Bible is because it's the word of God. May the Lord continue to use me to bless you until I die or until Christ comes because it's my joy to serve you. And thank you for praying for me. 
Thank you for fasting for me and my daughters. And thank you for supporting me financially to do the ministry. I couldn't do it without you guys. God bless you. You know who you are. May he richly bless you for helping me, his unprofitable servant, to be used of the Spirit. Keep praying for the provision, especially these upcoming months. I'm moving to my new place this weekend. It's going to be hard because that means I'm going to have to be alone in my apartment until my brother joins me at the end of March. So pray he'll come sooner than later. My daughters will be there because it's not the same without my kids. Going home, going to sleep by myself without my angels. At least I could put them to sleep and I could kiss them and I would go to their room and look at them and I'd say, thank you, Jesus. You gave me these beautiful angels, a delight to my heart. But because of sin, because of adultery, because of immorality, because of Satan, that has been taken away from me for over two years. Don't mean to be a sob story because I know people who haven't seen their kids in 20 years. God have mercy on you and the Lord sustain you. Love you guys for the sake of the Lord. Christ is risen, risen indeed, right? Right? Kiri eleison, kiri eleison, kiri eleison. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, have mercy. We love you. Try in God. Take care.